a retired homicide detective. I've interviewed thousands of people, from serial killers to ministers. Welcome to the interview room. Welcome to the interview room, everybody, on this Wednesday, Wednesday evening. So great to have everybody here, last minute, but I just think it was important to have this get together tonight. So great to see each and every one of you. So thankful that each of you are here. A special shout out to our mods, Miss Sophia, Maui Girl, Teresa M, and Mimi J2. We absolutely love these women. Karen and I cannot do this show without them, and we are forever grateful for their kindness, wisdom, inspiration, and guidance. What about this guy behind me, Mr. Buddy? Those of you who are just joining us, we want you to know that uh, our family travels in an Airstream, and Buddy keeps us out of trouble. He's a little Jack Russell Terrier. He's eight years old, and every once in a while, you'll hear him take off in the background. So uh, for that, we are grateful. Man, oh, man, what a week. Shout out to Nashville PD. That's how you take care of business, folks. You do not hesitate. You take it right where it belongs. God bless them and the families who are suffering in Nashville, our prayers, our thoughts are with each and every one of those families. Each and every one of them. I'm always grateful to have an opportunity to be on Nancy Grace's show. I want to give her a shout out as well. You know, she has been very, very gracious. Um, I should actually call her Nancy Gracious because um, she is she is just a, a fireball as everybody knows, and I'm going to link a podcast that I was on with her today, uh, and we're going to talk about some of the things that I mentioned there and about Stephen and the reason why we're here tonight, Stephen Smith, to talk about his case. There's a lot going on. As you guys know, Ronnie, Eric Bland uh, have been assembling an A-team and they've got some good folks, and you got to get over to uh, Nancy's podcast to hear who he put together. And it's an absolute amazing team. And I think uh, there's going to be some real interesting st things uh, coming forward. As always, whatever we discuss here this evening, all parties are innocent until proven guilty in a court of law. We do not use names. We use initials in the chat. Uh, so please be mindful of that if you're brand new with us. The only other thing that we ask is that you subscribe to this channel. Uh, we cannot thank you guys enough for your continual support. Um, we've had some just amazing success. God's opened the windows and uh, has really blessed us. Always a shout out to our first responders, our nurses, our doctors, EMTs, our military veterans and families, and our military service men and service members serving today. For you, we are grateful because without you, we could not have the freedoms that we have to have not only this YouTube channel, but everything else 
in this great country we call America and around the world to our friends in different parts of the world. Hopefully, they're seeing us and saying, that's a good country. We'd love to continue to be friends with them. Shout out to our uh, friends in the UK and, of course, across the pond, Ireland, and any other place you may be tuning in tonight. Wow. A lot going on. And what I want to talk about is, you know, about a couple of weeks ago, I did a, I did a, um, you know, an overview of Stephen Smith's case. I mean, Karen and I, we went out there to the scene and I, I tell you, I got to tell you that when I first got on that scene there, I immediately, um, thought, you know what, this just does not, what do we call it, guys and gals, does not look right, DLR, DLR. Uh, I stood right where his body was. I looked over at his cross that's memorializing his life, and I thought to myself, you know, this poor mom has been waiting for quite some time, and so we're going to go into a little bit uh, more information tonight uh, that I figured out from my perspective in terms of looking through the lens of my experience. And so I've got, as usual, a little PowerPoint set up here. And I'm going to lay out a couple of my observations. Now, one of the things that we know already and it's been you know factually documented there's a lot of information out there there's a lot of folks talking about this case uh, i'm going to approach it a little bit differently obviously through the lens uh, of my experience like i mentioned and what struck me almost immediately was you know this idea that everybody's been talking about you know how does this body get into the middle of the road as well as how did the investigators go from, you know, the sheriff's department first responding there, and then of course notifying the South Carolina Highway Patrol, and from there notifying SLED, and then back to the Highway Patrol. And so it just seems like there was a lot of, you know, moving parts, a lot of ping pong, for lack of a better term. And you know, whenever that type of situation starts to occur, we, we've got to look at all angles. Remember, we do not know at this point, nobody knows at this point, what actually, who actually took Stephen Smith's life. I will tell you right now that from my perspective, From my perspective, this is definitely not an automobile accident. And if anybody needs to know what my bio looks like, then you, you're more than welcome to click uh, on my page there on the word bio or in the description below, and that will speak for itself. But taking a look at this and doing it objectively, and, and, and even tonight, Again, if you're new to this channel, our goal here is always to be factual in nature. And that means sometimes if we don't have an answer, then we don't have an answer. However, we also, in order to get to those answers sometimes, you have to discuss theories, ideas that potentially point towards a particular direction in relationship to where they, the evidence takes us. And so tonight I want to talk about what evidence I think we have right in front of us. So right from the get-go, you know, we heard and we hear the idea 
that this is there's no way this is an automobile accident accident because and what's the number one thing everybody says because the shoes would have been blown off of his feet and i agree with that a million percent so keeping that in mind what we then have to think about are those shoes and the picture on the left you'll see the two little orange dots there those are they mark the tip of the feet and then there's a couple of dots one on the the hands i'm not going to show you all of those fo- all of those photographs they're available online anybody can see them but it's not necessary for my presentation tonight because i want to be specific about what the type of evidence i'm seeing right from the get go so if you look at the photograph on the right and we did a whole big piece on Nancy's show about this today if you notice the shoe that's facing you there's something very obvious on that shoe and what do you see what does everybody see in this particular photograph well that's mud and it's wet mud and on the side of that shoe is dried mud dirt so now we have to ask ourselves okay well if there's mud there has to be a water source of something and so we look at the shoe now and there is a like a little discoloration in between if you're looking at the photo the photo to the left you can see just at the tongue of the shoe it looks like there is a break in the color and i don't know if that is water below it going towards the tip of the shoe or if it's a discoloration in the shoe but what we do know and what i know based on just looking at this right now it's pretty obvious that is mud on those shoes the bottom of the shoes now the reason i put this photograph up here on the right is because that mud is impacted into those shoes and so one of the things that is really interesting then is as we objectively look at this if the photograph on the right i zoomed in to the mud on those shoes and you'll notice it's smooth does everybody see that on the photograph on the right it's smooth so if he's walking in the middle of the street then we would want to do an analysis in terms of a comparison to the asphalt and there is the asphalt i zoomed in on the asphalt you can still see his hand in the upper right hand corner but when we go back to his shoe there is no pattern or at least an indication of a pattern that i can see that would be consistent with the asphalt what say you what say you so when we think about that we have to realize that these shoes are a very very important 
piece of evidence. So the next thing then you would want to look at is if in fact this individual was not walking in the street, then the question is how does he get in the street? And where is the mud and or water source that would impact into the bottom of his shoe? Because if he's walking in the street at 3 o'clock in the morning, that's the surface he's walking on because that's where his body was found. And so the next piece of the puzzle that we start looking for, and this is another close-up, the picture on the left, you can clearly see the what appears to be a discoloration on the left shoe in the front. It looks like it goes, you know, top to bottom, i.e. meaning towards the top of his... Uh, calf down to his tip of his toes on the left shoe and then on the right shoe it's pretty obvious as you zoom in you see clearly that that marking that smooth piece of mud has not been disturbed by any asphalt that I can tell so the next question then is what we we would call a body dump. And when I zoomed in a little bit closer on the shoe on the left, the picture on the left, you can clearly see, and everybody can do this, go ahead and pull the photographs up yourself, and you can clear, clearly see that the mud is wet on the bottom and dried where the lines are, the two lines on the shoe of the white part, the photograph on the left, that is dried mud or dirt. So now it becomes significant in relationship to the positioning of this body. And authorities had this that very night. They saw this, or hopefully they saw this, that very evening. Because this would have been a huge, huge red flag the very first night. And it would have added credence to the theory that this is not a hit-and-run vehicle accident. And this would have helped, I believe, maybe the medical examiner whose position was and is that because he's in the middle of the road, he was hit by a car. Well, those shoes, doctor, whoever you are, tell a different story. Forget the fact that they weren't blown off his feet. It's actually a good thing because this evidence speaks for itself. As they say, you know, a photo's worth a thousand words. Well, they're looking at it. Everybody's looking at it. And they're going to start looking at it after tonight. This was his phone that was found in his pocket on the road. My understanding, the family has given this number to get in to the authorities, and they were able to get into this phone. 
So as we all know, there's going to be a tremendous amount of information flowing from the contents of this for, uh, digital for, footprint, this forensic footprint, electronic footprint. So one of the things now, going back to the, the thought about the positioning of the body, is, you know, let's look at the clothing. If we have indications of mud on the shoes, which there is, there's no indication of it, it's there, then what is it in the clothing that becomes relevant to that? Well, what, we'd, what you'd want to be doing, obviously, is start looking for additional markings such as dirt, a significant type of uh, um, markings on the clothing that would indicate maybe a struggle, muddy, bloody clothes, or excuse me, muddy clothes, any type of mud, um, if he was pushed down. And just because it's not on his clothing does not mean it did not occur. But what it does mean on the shoes is there potentially could be a secondary, what we call what we call in the business a secondary crime scene. And that would be the what we would say we would identify as the first crime scene. Wherever that mud originated, and there are ways of getting this mud identified. Um, I mentioned to Nancy today that we had a caper. It was a body dump in the mountains. And what we did was we had a suspect who said, uh, I wasn't even around. I don't know what you guys are talking about. And so what we did is we took his filters out of his car. And then we went to the area we had some doctors go up there, botanists, and they took ev samples of all the vegetation and the pollen in that particular geographic region where the body was found. And they were able to do some scientific matches to pollen found within inside of this individual's filter of his car. So with this, you have mud. And sometimes that mud, you know, could be connected to a particular type of region. Let's say those cornfields, for an example, if they're using certain chemicals in those particular cornfields, or where the car was felt, where the car was discovered. You can collect samples within that area and then see if they are, there is any kind of connection in relationship to the mud discovered on the bottom of those shoes. And in today's world, you will be surprised what, these scientists are capable of doing. So what stuck out to me on the shorts right away were the two indication, the two marks to the left looking at the photo, just where the zipper area is. I will be very curious to find out what that is. And I'm hoping that SLED is listening tonight. I know Eric Bland is listening. And his team. And I'm hoping they still have these items where they can do this comparative analysis. And I want to go back and show everybody again. Look at Stephen's shoes. 
But more importantly, look at the photograph on the right. That is a very smooth surface. That mud is compacted into that shoe. And so then the logical step would be look at the surface he was, quote, walking on in the middle of the street. Well, that's the surface right there. You can see his arm in the upper right-hand corner. So that tells us something. Does anybody in the chat see an impression? I'm going to ask this again because there's more people coming in. Of this asphalt into this shoe. So this is somewhat um, important, I would think. And hopefully they have those shoes and hopefully they can scrape that mud. Not all of it, because you want to obviously maintain it, but you could dig out, you know, some of that mud and have it analyzed. And then what you can potentially do, as we talked about a second ago, is go back to the car area. So here was the medical examiner's cause of death. Blood, blunt head trauma due to motor vehicle crash. Pedestrian versus vehicle. Not buying it. Um, those of you who know me, uh, that that's, sog that's soggy bread is what we call it here on TIR. It's it's just not not lining up. Does not look right. Does not look right. So if we go back to the scene then, and that orange dot now, you you recognize it where the positioning of the arms, the legs, and the feet were of this poor boy. So we go back to the scene, we see there's woods on the right, and there's cornfields on the left, and Karen and I were walking this area at the time, or recently, and the area where he was discovered at that late morning hour would have been, you would have seen a freight train coming for 50 miles. Now, I, I haven't been there at night, but I have talked to some people that have been, and every indication that everybody talks about is it's pitch black, and that makes a lot of sense. That makes a lot of sense. So now we go back to the car, and what shows up almost immediately around the car, guys. Everybody seeing what I'm seeing? Nancy saw it right away. And this appears to be a soft surface, potentially maybe even capable because the car, I can't tell if the car is sinking, but there's a lot more photographs that we're going to go through here. But is this, an, is this the source of the mud? I don't know. Because I'm not seeing any water around this area. Those shoes to me at this point without physically having them to examine indicate that there was potentially some type of water around him. 
Now, I did a little research a couple hours ago. And there are a couple of boat launches not far away. And I'm doing a little more learning that some of those areas around there were places where people would, you know, hook up, connect. So I don't know if that's relevant personally at this point. I don't think we have any evidence of that. However, what we do have now is we definitely have, you know, we, we used to say that every victim, God leaves a witness. And at this point, that witness could have been those shoes. And it and it's been interesting to hear, you know, the conversation about, well, the shoes weren't blown off because it was, you know, it, it would have been really clear that it was an automobile, uh, automobile accident. Well, the positioning of the body, in my opinion, the next thing we'd want to see, again, like I uh, was mentioning, or we're getting ready to mention, is the leg position underneath the ankles under the backside in the autopsy, you'd want to see a couple of things. The onset of lividity and any type of bruising and or impressions as if somebody picked them up. Yes. Vet girl, thank you so much as always. The interesting thing about the car is it does look pretty you know, significant. Now, what's in, what, why this is important is for obvious reasons. Notice how it's parked succinctly. And look how far off the road it is. So you have this young man allegedly parking his car here taking the precaution to get his car way off the road. You can see it there. It's got to be at least 5, 10 feet. And then subsequently somehow decides, you know what? I'm just going to walk in the middle of the road. So he takes his time to protect his car, but he's not thinking about his person. I don't know about that. I don't know about that. I don't know what the soil was that day, if that, if it was possible to leave that impression on the shoes underneath. But it just doesn't, doesn't feel right, doesn't look right. But I could be wrong. The gas cap is left out. And, you know, we could go on for days on this. How many have run out of gas, taken the cap off, and just left it there in your own personal experience? Anyone? And, and does that gas indicator, i.e. the the flap, do you have to open that up from the inside of the car? And if you're out of gas and you're the driver, will you just go look at the gas indicator? It says out of gas, E for empty. What are you going to do? You're going to pop the, the gas cap off here and look into the tank? at three o'clock in the morning. And this is why the victimology is so important on this young man. It's really important because we know he was going to school, you know, studying nursing. He had a class that night. And then you have to ask yourself, 
why in the world is he looking into his gas tank? So this in of itself just doesn't look right. It just does not look right. So then we get a little bit further into this, and these the officers have obviously opened the doors for photography purposes to document the scene. So you have the car off to the side of the road. Look how far off it is. You have the gas cap open. And now when you look into the car, you uh, this is the back side of it. But when you look into the car, initially things, you know, may not look out of place. So what the authorities are going to do, at, and I don't know if they've done it, is you want to run an ALS into this car, an alternate light source. You want to throw fingerprint powder around. And Nancy caught that today. He, she didn't see any fingerprint powder anywhere on the exterior of this car, specifically around the gas cap area. You want to throw powder all over the place. You want to see seat positioning. The seat positioning will tell you the height potential of the driver. And look how this front seat looks to be a little bit further ahead. So you will want you would want to know the height and the weight of Stephen. I can't, you can't really see it. Uh, I was trying to see if you could tell just how much further up that driver's seat is. But you can see it appears to be a little bit further ahead than the passenger seat. So the question is, how tall is this driver? You can sometimes... There are experts uh, that one reconstructionist, I bet, can do it in um, the Murdoch case. And I know um, that guy is brilliant. I forget his name, the doctor out of South Carolina. I love that guy. If they have the car, you may be able to go back and match this seat position based on the roof of the vehicle it looks like there's a a mark on the roof of the vehicle and you'd be able to match that headliner up to the um head backrest to kind of get a position of how tall steven was and we don't even know if he parked the car there or if it ran out of gas there what if somebody dr kensley thank you gary Yes, that's him, Dr. Kensley. I appreciate that. We don't even know if Stephen actually parked his own car here. If this is a, you know, a situation that is staged, then maybe the suspect is that height. The other thing I love about this car is the United States Marine Corps sticker at the top. When I saw that, I was all in on trying to help this young man and this family. This mom and his sister needs answers. So then we go a little bit further into the car. This is his anatomy book from school. And then, of course, the picture to the left uh, underneath to the right side of the seat at the bottom, that's where we find his wallet. 
Now, the placement of the wallet in of itself, just the placement in of itself, we used to do a uh, exercise. It's called Who's in My Car? And I would take a class of seasoned homicide investigators and we would divide them up. And then what we would do is we would, you know, get a couple of cars as volunteers. And then we divide them up into teams. And I would then throw the keys to these groups and then take the volunteer's car and say to these guys, go find the secret life about and of who owns this car. Tell me about the personality in this car. And then I would take a sheet of paper and hand it. And we still do this exercise to the investigator or to the owner of the car and then ask them to list all the things they will not find out about this individual's personality. So this car in of itself tells us a tremendous amount about Stephen's personality. It tells us about his, his interest in school. It tells us that he likes Ritz crackers that are down at the bottom there. It tells us, you know, baby powder is significant for some reason. Oil. And you have to ask yourself, okay, well then, and you'd want to ask yourself, okay, well, what's going on with all of these items with inside of this vehicle? And is this an organized individual or is this a disorganized individual? Is he, you know, just kind of scatterbrained? And if so, why? What is it in his personality that, you know, kind of does this for him? Is he artistic? Is he the light of the party? Is he funny? Because you see a lot of this in those types of personalities, the way the car looks, right? It's kind of like the locker at high school. Is he just messy? Right, exactly, Shirley. Is he just messy? But that's part of his personality. And so the wallet becomes significant. Positioned in this fashion against the door frame like this. I don't know how many teenagers and or young adults like 19 who just randomly stick their wallet in between the door frame like this. This is not typical behavior because that wallet has so many stories connected to it so many stories what i mean what do i mean by that right well that's that wallet gives him the authority to drive that wallet gives him the authority to go to school that wallet gives him somewhat of a control mechanism with inside of himself to do certain things with inside of his own personal life. That wallet is an extension of his phone. You notice he had his phone. Well, that wallet either A, was lost and he'd been looking for it, or B, it makes no sense for it to be out of place. And that's what this appears to be, completely out of place in the right front, or excuse me, the back, hang on for a minute, sorry, the right front passengers seat in between the seat and the door frame. 
I don't know. This is like the shoe. It's not it's not sticking in common sense because remember every behavior has a purpose. So what is the purpose of Stephen putting his crackers and his wallet in that position when he ran out of gas that night? Very, very concerning. Very suspicious. I don't know if we're going to get an answer just yet. But the, you know, the the full bag of crackers in of itself, where did those crackers come from? You could take the, that cracker package and you could, uh, you know, see if there's any type of fingerprints on it. And if whoever has that car, if those crackers are still in there, you can take that that package of saltines there are or Ritz crackers and put them in a fish tank and put super glue in it and see what kind of prints come up. See what kind of prints come up. Okay. What else in this car are you guys seeing over in the chat? I'm going to look over here in the chat for a minute. Anybody got information on this side? Take a look here. Okay, so one thought is the wallet may have been on top of the books and slid and slid off. Okay, I could see that. That's a possibility. Okay. That is a possibility. The baby or the powder. I can't tell what kind of powder. I said it was just baby powder. That was just, you know, from my own thinking. But why, why, wonder what mom says about that in terms of for him. Why you would have that little container of baby powder or powder in there. The oil makes sense if he's having vehicle challenges. And I believe the family may have the car. And so, you know, the fact that they they may have this car, this would be significant. Hopefully, well, I'm sure it's been moved and everything by now, but we'd also want to know, you know, what his favorite treats were. Were they, you know, were they these types of crackers? You know, those kind of things. Uh, I see the baby powder people are mentioning could have been for the shoes, interior of the shoes for smell. Great observation. That is really interesting. Yeah, we don't know what that is on the edge of the seat. I don't know. I don't know if anybody knows what that could be. I don't see any thing that's jumping out at me here on this, other than the wallet itself. And obviously, there are cards in here, like his driver's license, et cetera. I think our biggest clue for this right now are two things. Those two marks on the photo on the left. The phone, because you'll be able to get a digital download. 
And then, of course, my understanding is there is some type of tablet somewhere in this equation that they're trying to get into. So that would be significant. I do not know where he was coming from or where he was. I, my understanding is he was traveling to his father's house. And I do not know what the car inventory was and is to this day. And somebody just said, uh, pink butterfly powder is shower to shower. Okay. The two spots on the, on the pants, I can't tell what that is. I don't know what that is. Yeah, and this, this, these shoes here, the, to the left up on the, the white with the two lines, that is, that is dried, looks like dried mud. If you zoom in on them, you guys can go do your, check it out your, your, um, on your own. But if you zoom, zoom in on these photographs, you can clearly see that the mud on the bottom of the shoe is damp and wet and the mud on the side of the shoe is dry. So he, they would have lifted him from top, somebody at the, underneath the shoulders, like the old fireman grab, and then somebody at the ankles. And I looked through some of the autopsy photos um, and I'm going to wait to see what some of the opinions come out based on them, you know, exhuming his body. All right, let's see what we got here. He was driving out there, buys his wallet on the passenger side. That's a great question. Why is his wallet out of his shorts when he has his phone in his shorts? Which I didn't put the other photographs in because, you know, I, I want it to be considerate of the family. But I'll go back and look a little bit closer about the, you know, looking at some of these photos to see the zippers, if they're uh, attached or opened, closed or open. But you can clearly see, in my opinion, right now, you can see a discoloration in this shoe outside of the mud. I'm still thinking there's got to be a water source somewhere because this asphalt look here is just not lining up with how smooth it is underneath, you know, underneath the bottom of his shoes. Yeah, his shoes do look wet, Paul. I, I agree with that. I I mean, I can't tell 100%, but they do. They do. They do. Well, we're going to find out because once, though, I know SLED has, a fix, has officially c concluded, i.e. determined that this is a homicide. And they are taking the steps necessary to now conduct a homicide investigation. So that, that all of a sudden brings a lot more resources to the table. I, I do feel really, really bad for mom who's had to fight tooth and nail to get the attention that she deserves for her son on this case. And Obviously, at this point, it appears this thing is headed in the right direction now. And maybe those parties involved will come to the table. Uh, 
just looking at the positioning of the body on some of the photographs that I've seen, uh, I'm going to tell you, in my opinion, this is just my opinion, there is more than one person involved in this. And because what folks, you know, don't remember is you just, once somebody is deceased, then at this point, at that point, you have a lot of weight that you have to move around. And so I didn't see any evidence of somebody dragging him to the center of the street. I see evidence that somebody carried him and dropped him in the street. And that's my opinion. And I've worked well north of 300 murders in my career. So I believe there is more than one individual involved in this. And so we'll just have to see how that unfolds and what, you know, what the evidence points to. But the other part of this is we have to start looking at very clearly where that mud came from, where it originated. And as a result of that, that will give us all kinds of information about Stephen that evening. The car looks like it made a U-turn so far off and wheel turn. Also, the right foot position does not appear. He was hit and flew flat on the ground. Totally, 100% agree. Tracy, that is a great comment. Totally, 100% agree with you. The positioning of his legs and his upper torso is inconsistent with an automobile strike. And I've had many cases based on even I, uh, you know, I've had automobile accidents that, that turned into vehicular homicides where I've seen people just get launched and trashed. And typically you see like the legs even going in different directions because of the velocity of the impact. And if this young man was, quote, hit by a truck mirror, uh, then you're going to see evidence of that mirror all over the road. Now, the other thing is you notice on the right picture, look at the what appears to be a dirt discoloration on the shorts. Does everybody see that near his pocket area? I can't tell what that is. Is that the same? Is it consistent with the dirt on his shoes? And his positioning there, in a, where his body is positioned and how it's positioned there, if you were to stand where those two dots are, where they marked his uh, feet, and envision bending down and picking him up by the ankles and then somebody else at the top underneath him like the fireman drag and the two people going out to the middle of the road and going clunk. Okay. Because on one of the photographs in the upper right, the his arm, which facing, you can't see it because it's blurred out but some of the other photographs, you can clearly see it. There is some type of blood on the top, which I would call the top because it's exposed, of the arm here. There's blood here. Okay. Well, that could be transfer from somebody carrying him. Okay. From the suspect getting the victim's blood on them, and then while they're carrying them, transferring that blood from their clothing to back to the victim under here. 
if if this if the individual is just kind of doing this because remember this is dead weight at that point so if you've got one person at the ankles and you've got a second person now lifting on the other side and there's blood involved you are now transferring that victim's blood onto that individual who potentially if this is a body dump carrying that victim and then there's a high probability based on moving that you're going to get transfer so those are the other things that i'm thinking and within 30 minutes you potentially could have lividity setting in 30 minutes to four hours with full lividity you know kicking in four plus hours after and it all depends on temperatures and a variety of other things but if you look at some of the pictures from the autopsy that's going to tell us a lot about the positioning of his legs and if there's any bruising underneath his ankles sometimes you can even see handprints you know around the ankles i've had you know many cases where you can see that somebody has grabbed something or somebody and the lividity you know has settled underneath but you can still see the fingerprints the void underneath uh, i mean just do this to your arm guys look at that see that see how that works that's what you potentially could see the lividity sets right so once that heart stops that blood starts to settle quickly and within 30 minutes it's starting to really stain and tell a picture of the positioning of this body so why does he quote walk in the middle of the street with his phone doesn't make sense why does he leave his wallet at the house or excuse me in the car doesn't make sense why does he leave his gas cap hanging out? Doesn't make sense. Why does he position his car the way it's positioned, perfectly off the road? Doesn't make sense. Why is there blood, or excuse me, mud on the bottom of his shoes and not disturbed visually at this point by the asphalt that he's allegedly walking on? doesn't make sense why is there no debris at the car or at the accident scene quote unquote doesn't make sense why does the south carolina highway patrol feel this was not an accident makes a lot of sense why is sled opening this up as a homicide makes a lot of sense at this point, the evidence is pointing towards this is a staged body dump. And Stephen Smith and his family need answers. They need answers. And so I'm going to stay with it like everybody else and if i see more i'll come up as always and report on it okay so friday night you're not going to want to miss my guest i've got dr gary Percato coming back friday night and he has an interesting theory about motive on Alec Murdoch. If you've never heard Dr. Bricado speak, you are in for a treat. I don't know that answer, Moon Eyes. Maybe somebody else will. He is one of the most brilliant men I've ever <laughs> spoken to. He is 
absolutely amazing. And he's got some theories that he's going to talk about. And for those of you that don't know him, uh, just Google his name, Dr. Gary Broccato. He's going to be uh, on, I think, the Oxygen Network this Sunday night uh, for a program about uh, Bundy and Killers. And then next Sunday, the following week, episode number two, uh, yours truly and the Cold Case Foundation uh, will weigh in on a case from many years ago in the 70s. And um, I'll get you that information, and Gary's going to talk about it Friday night. But you're not going to want to miss it. If you're new to our channel, we only ask that you subscribe and just and sh share this video with all your friends and your neighbors. Please hit that thumbs up. We are forever grateful. And of course, we thank each and every one of you, our members, our subscribers, our Patreon members. We can't do any of this without you. We sure love you and appreciate you. But And more importantly as well, our mods. We have Miss Sophia, who's our team lead, Maui Girl, Teresa M, and Mimi J2. Again, these women uh, give Karen and I a tremendous amount of information on how to navigate YouTube. And for that, we are always, always grateful. But more importantly, for you, the audience, we are so grateful to each and every one of you. Thank you so much for trusting us and always being here with us. God bless you. Have a good evening. And I will see you Friday night uh, for another amazing show with Dr. Gary Procato. Talk to you then. Hard working every day. I'm stressed out. 24-7, babe. No, no timeouts. Wish we could fly away. You and I go to our favorite place. Oh, yeah. Special memories Together I'll be your company Now and forever I say we fly away You and me Go to our favorite place Feeling the sun on my face in a while Facing a wall